what we'll try to do in 15 minutes is uh, give you an overview of your options for open access publishing. And then if we have time, also um, talk a little bit about preprints, but I'll let that depend on, on the time. The presentation is available um, for uh, also for you to, to open and share and reuse. It has a Creative Commons license and um, the link, I'll put that in the chat later, or perhaps some of you can do that. So we'll be talking about your options for open access publishing, and that can either be in so-called hybrid journals, which are regular subscription journals that allow you to uh, or enable you to publish open access usually for a fee, uh, or in full gold open access journals, which are journals that only publish open access uh, articles that sometimes charge a fee, but often also they don't. It's not necessarily so that open access publishing at journals always uh, is for a fee. Um, and then the third option is uh, what we call green open access, which is sharing a version of your article, and that can be either the published version or the author accepted manuscript, which is your manuscript after peer review, but before the final editing by the journal, so the nice layout and the publisher logo and all that. Um, but in content exactly the same as the published version, share that author accepted manuscript in a repository like the Utrecht University repository. Uh, Pauline will tell you a little bit more later on about the different ways uh, Utrecht University supports researchers in that, including covering your publication costs in many way, many cases where there are publication costs. But first, we'd like to discuss some open access policies that affect you, because publishing open access makes your work available to a wider range of people, gives more people access to your works and also enables and ensures that your work can be reused depending on the license you attach to that. Funders think, uh, funders also consider that important. So for the research they fund, increasingly there are um, requirements for open access publishing. And some that you might be, may be familiar with or that directly affect you could be the uh, Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020 policy that uh, requires open access to uh, research articles coming out of their funding. That can be either uh, by publishing open access in journals, including hybrid journals, or self-archiving. can be the auto accepted version or the published version. And currently, they still allow a six-month embargo for STEM research. But uh, starting with Horizon Europe, there are a couple of changes. They will require immediate open access, so no embargo periods to allow anyone immediate access to the publications, and also require a CC BY license, meaning that um, research can not only be read, but can also be reused. And uh, as far as reimbursement goes, uh, APCs, so article processing charges, can be reimbursed from your grants, but only for publications in full open access journals. And those policies are very similar to the new policies from NWO. NWO has had an open access policy for a number of years now that also requires open access publishing either in open access journals, hybrid journals, or um, by green archiving. Um, with a new policy that's starting for grants that are published now. So if you currently have a grant, the old policy applies. If you get a grant from anything that's published now, then the new policy, uh, which aligns with Plan S, will apply. And that means that uh, it needs to be the auto accepted manuscript or published version can no longer be. Grants. It needs to be immediate open access and also have a CC BY license. And to, to quell a common misunderstanding, Plan S does not forbid publishing in hybrid journals. Um, it doesn't pay for publishing in hybrid journals. That's usually covered in other ways. Pauline will say more about that. You can still publish in hybrid journals only to comply with Plan S. You then also have to archive uh, your paper in a repository, unless that hybrid journal is part of any of the big deals that we have with them. And I should also stress that these are not just policies and requirements to make you tick more boxes, but they're really meant to increase um, access to publications and also to uh, to force public or to 
induce publishers to also change their ways and really move away from subscription and hybrid and move to more full open access. About that immediate open access, uh, NWL also with their plan as uh, they allow you a way to archive your publications in a repository. Also when the journal says you cannot do that or you can also only do that after six months or 12 months. If you have an NWL fund, um, you can add uh, a words retention statement to your submission saying that because you are funded by NWO, you retain the right for uh, distributing your auto accepted manuscript under a CC BY license immediately. And with that, you can then archive it in the repository, even if the publisher has a different policy. So these are some policies and uh, at Utrecht, we do a lot also to, uh, to make that possible. And Pauline will take over from here and tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, hi all. Thank you, Bianca. Um, we saw this slide earlier, but now um, I want to focus on the services that the UU offers. Uh, for the closed journals, uh, yeah, they are behind a paywall without any options to publish open access. And examples are, uh, for instance, uh, New England Journal of Medicine or journals from Nature Publishing Group. Uh, for these closed journals, uh, a lot of money is paid Pauline, via, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but is your camera on? I can't no. see you. Or is that uh, on purpose? Ah, thanks. Yeah, I was on purpose, but never mind. <laughs> I will open it if you want, <laughs> so anyone can see me. So the, the, <laughs> it's very open. <laughs> yes, yeah, very open. You're right. For this, so for these closed journals, a lot of money is, is, has been paid uh, uh, via big deals budget and also acquisition budget of MC Utrecht. Then we have the hybrid journals. Uh, they can be found in the journal browser. And I'll come to this uh, topic in the next slide. Uh, necessary arrangements with publishers have been made by university in, uh, universities in the Netherlands in order to avoid double paying. So pay for a subscription and again for open access uh, publishing. Yeah, I'm ah. yeah, Bianca, thank you very much. No. <laughs> Very sorry. Yeah, my was. second screen. I thought this was fine. Continue. Okay. Okay. Continue. Uh, where was I? The gold journals. Uh, for the gold journals, a complete other business model uh, uh, is applicable. We don't pay for a sub subscription. You, as an author, you um, pay via article processing charges, and usually these costs are rather high. Post Biomed Central are good examples of, uh, of popular publishers with uh, gold, full gold uh, journals. But as an author, you have the option of uh, green and simply send your article to Utrecht University Library and we will take care of the uptake take in our uh, repository and open the article in six months time. And I will elucidate on this topic later. Um, as um, some uh, some publishers want you to wait longer, much longer, and then there is legal backing provided when you open your own article, and this uh, backing is uh, comes from your employer. So for the next slide, Bianca, uh, cell genomics, um, a high impact paper. There are a lot of high impact papers in the journal browser. You can simply look up the title and you see open access 100% APC discount for UU and also UMCU authors. Very easy. Um, and actually all these links and information is also on Connect. You can get a lot of questions about this, but I always refer to the Connect page. And then the next slide, Bianca. There is this uh, open access uh, fund. You can uh, get a refund from Utrecht University Open Access Fund with a maximum of 1,000 euros uh, per article. Uh, and the refund can also come from funders, as Bianca already mentioned. Uh, after the presentation, we will unhide the next slide where you can see what agreement has been made or discount you get. Uh, per publisher and also available, all, all the information also available on openaccess.nl. Uh, for the next slide, please. 
this uh, um, pilot you share, we take care. Some of you have heard of, of it, 140, nearly 140 um, employees of Utrecht University already participated in an earlier pilot and, and op uh, we opened up all their uh, published works and created this more visibility. And you can find their works in Google Scholar, for instance, and can the, the work can be used all over the world. This is what we want. So next slide. Uh, a lot of information and uh, figures and percentages on this slide. Open access in the Netherlands versus UU. Uh, look on the right hand side in the upper part, you see uh, for 2019, 2020 is not available yet. 62% of the articles in the Netherlands are open access and look in on the on the uh, figure on the below, you see the, the uh, differentiation between the faculties. You see for uh, medicine, it's 58%. And as a total for, for Utrecht University, uh, 63%. So this is a little bit in line with what happens in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, next slide. Then we go into a little bit more detail and you see this uh, visualized in the, in the graphs here. And on the left hand side, you see the number of papers, uh, still um, it's all a comparison between the, the faculties. Um, it's of course no surprise that UMC Utrecht publishes uh, about uh, the same amount as, as the whole uh, University Utrecht put together. <laughs> But there's still a, a big a gray part, but um, I can tell you, uh, it's interesting to, to know that in 2015, the number of non-open access papers in the UMC was 1,752, and for 2020, it's uh, 782, so it gets less. Uh, and then the percentages, you can look afterwards for yourself. And then we go over to the next slide and dive even deeper into the number and the percentages. And then you see the differentiation uh, between the uh, divisions, which uh, maybe opens uh, up or stimulates discussion between you. Uh, there are differences, and maybe as we picked up last week in a meeting with UMC, it could be that collaborations with commercial partners be a hindrance for open access publishing, but I don't know, maybe there are more factors. And of course, we hope to reach 100% in the upcoming periods. Well, now I would like to give the floor to Bianca again. And up for and cover preprint in two or three minutes. Um, just very briefly, uh, Sander already mentioned in his introduction uh, his own commitment to uh, posting preprints, and uh, he can tell you a lot about uh, actually how easy it is to post a preprint. Um, as a little bit of context, uh, preprints, uh, submitting, uh, publishing, sharing your manuscript before it has been published. So more people can have access to the research results earlier, not held up by the time it takes for, for peer review. It also opens up possibilities for feedback, uh, opens up possibilities for subsequent, for other forms of peer review on top of preprints. And of course, when the papers are finally published in a journal, they're also linked to the final publication. So there's a clear link, people going to the preprint so will also see if the paper has been published in a journal. There are different types of preprint servers that are good to be aware of. There are preprint servers that are um, often disciplinary, like BioArchive for Life Sciences, MedArchive for Medical Sciences, or uh, multidisciplinary preprint servers uh, like Synodo, where you can also put another, a lot of other research output. These are usually, not always, but usually community-driven, community-governed, often non-profit. And, um, on the, other, on the other side, there are also increasingly preprint servers linked to publishers, where publishers make it really easy. If you submit a paper to them, then they will publish it on their preprint server. There are pros and cons to both. We can discuss this later if for people who are interested. Um, preprints in medicine. Um, 
have been have had a slow start. Life sciences um, has had uh, has been using BioArchive for quite a while now. Medicine is really catching up with the launch of MedArchive and especially also spurred on by COVID-19, where you can see that uh, in this graph, the number of preprints and also the variety of preprint servers where those preprints are posted because there's more in the world than just BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, Sandra is a very good ambassador for preprints. Mark Bonte, uh, another one um, at UMC Utrecht, also a very good ambassador for preprints because he now publishes all his research first as preprints, as in this example. The benefits of preprints that are already alluded to, you make your results available earlier, uh, you can get feedback, you can claim priority already by publishing a preprint, stating that this is your research. They're citable, you can get a DOI for them even before they are a journal article. Most journals do allow preprints now. They're really a vanishing minority of journals that do not allow it. And as I said, links are made between preprints and publications. So the record of versions of a publication is clear. And I would end with perhaps an, um, uh, a call to action to follow Sander's example, to follow an example of many of your colleagues at UMC and just, um, and just try this out and really take the plunge and start publishing your research as preprints in addition to publishing in, in a journal. In, close off. The, the last slide in uh, minus one minute. <laughs> uh, the links on open access, you can find all the information about open access on our website and also on Connect about uh, all the uh, Dutch agreements with publishers on and copyright questions. You, you have the links are uh, attached. And uh, well, if there still remain questions, con me, contact me as your liaison in UMC Utrecht for U Utrecht University Library. And thank you for your attention.